Today's webinar is Make It Count, Stretching Dollars in Barrier Removal. Our presenter today is Michelle Cook. She is the Training and Technical Assistance Specialist here at the Mid-Atlantic ADA Center. Um, and she has a, um, an extensive background in uh, accessible parks and recreation. So is a really great person to give us uh, information on how we can make the most out of the little bit of money we have to work with. So Michelle, thanks so much. I'm gonna hand it over to you. Thanks so much, Carlene, for the intro and thank you all for being here today uh, to get some ideas on how to spend those dollars in the most effective way um, or where to place your energies in the most impactful way um, or really, you know, just to maybe just get some new ideas that you haven't thought of before or didn't think would make a big impact. So um, we're going to cover a lot of that uh, today. And as Carlene mentioned, please place your questions in the Q&A box at any time. I will pause a couple of times throughout the presentation uh, to check in on your questions. So starting on slide 11. I thought it would be um, a good idea to go back to basics um, to, to get this kicked off. Um, you know, hopefully we're, we are right at the top of the hour. So let's take a couple minutes while people are um, still refreshing their coffees or tea, uh, getting a, a drink or a snack um, and joining the webinar to just kind of go through some basics. Um, a lot of uh, when we talk about barrier removal and um, what is easily or readily achievable in terms of making changes or improvements um, regarding the ways that people can benefit from your services or activities, it really often does come back to basics. So I wanted to start with a little bit of that basic coverage today during today's webinar. Next slide, slide 12. So as a very quick recap, the Americans with Disabilities Act is broken down into five titles. Title I is employment. Title II covers state and local government um, or public entities. Title III covers places of public accommodation, those private businesses and also commercial facilities. Title IV is telecommunications and Title V is miscellaneous provisions. Today we'll be emphasizing Titles II and III most primarily. Um, but if you are an employer, there are certainly things that you will be able to take away from this presentation as well that will improve um, the opportunities for your employees or your potential employees um, with disabilities or the ability of your agency to welcome um, future employees who have disabilities. Next slide, 13. Title II covers all programs, services, and activities of state and local government agencies, also called public entities, as I mentioned before. Um, so if you are joining us today um, from a state or local government agency, you are covered under Title II of the ADA. Next slide, 14. And Title III, once again, to quickly review, Title III covers those private businesses. Um, they're also called in the provisions places of public accommodations. Um, those are businesses that operate places that serve the general public. Um, also, commercial facilities are covered under Title III. Those are factories, warehouses, um, similar facilities not uh, generally open to the, the public. Next slide, 15. Places of public accommodation. Under Title III, it's kind of important to understand um, those private entities that own, lease, lease to, or operate a place of public accommodation um, are covered under that Title III provision. And there are 12 types of places of public accommodation specifically listed out in the law. Um, the photo on this slide shows a group of diverse individuals on what looks like a rooftop um, restaurant or bar um, overlooking an urban environment in the background, um, maybe the top of a hotel um, or other uh, type of establishment. Next slide, 16. So these, uh, the next two slides, slides 16 and 17, will cover, uh, it just lists out the types of uh, places of public accommodation that are covered under the ADA. Those include places of lodging, inns and hotels, um, establishments serving food or drink, any restaurant, bar, bakery, cafe, um, places like that, 
places of exhibition or entertainment like movie theaters, concert halls, um, and other performing arts venues. Places of public gathering like convention centers or other spaces that might host special events. Sales or rental establishments, again, bakeries, grocery store, clothing store, shopping center, um, other uh, sales type businesses. Service establishments as well, including dry cleaners, banks, barbershops, gas stations, professional offices, any place providing that public service. And next slide, slide 17. Any station used for specific public transportation. So those are terminals and depots, uh, buses, trains, uh, any types of, of uh, specific, specified public transportation options, those are covered. Places of public display or collections like museums and libraries. Places of recreation such as zoos or amusement parks. Places of education, including um, all levels of education from um, very young uh, children up through uh, post-secondary and even private schools. Social service establishments are also covered, daycare centers, food banks, adoption agencies, and places of exercise or recreation, such as your fitness facilities, bowling alleys, uh, golf courses, um, general recreation centers, parks. Um, those are also covered um, under Title III um, as uh, if they're not owned or operated by a state or local government facility, which then would be Title II. Next slide, slide 18. The ways that we implement the Americans with Disabilities Act and meet the needs of people with disabilities in those various types of locations, those covered entities, is care they're carried out in a variety of ways. One of them is through our policies, practices, and procedures. No matter what type of business or establishment or service um, you are providing for public access, there's going to be associated ways that you conduct business and likely those are covered through various policies, practices, and procedures. So when we're talking about um, you know high impact and low cost ways to really make a difference in terms of the experience of people with disabilities, start with what you're currently doing. Take a critical look um, and a, a with a with a critical eye at how you're currently conducting business and seeing if there's something that needs to be adjusted. Slide 18. I'm sorry, slide 19, um, highlights those reasonable modifications to those policies, practices, and procedures. Covered entities, anybody covered by those various titles in the ADA, um, need to make reasonable modifications in their policies, practices, and procedures to ensure equal opportunities are provided for people with disabilities. Um, some examples of those may be modifying reservation systems um, so to make sure that um, various uh, rooms or uh, in, a, in a place of lodging or seats in, a, in an arena um, or for a ticketed event, um, those accessible features are held for the people who need those features um, until your know, maximum capacities have been reached or other things that align with uh, policy related to those, those particular issues. Um, another good one is uh, modifying a policy where you have no pets allowed in your facilities. Um, no exceptions are being made for pets. You modify that policy to make sure that you are allowing um, the protected uh, classes of service animals um, and individuals with disabilities who utilize service animals uh, in those public places. Those are um, really good and common examples of reasonable modification. Um, so look at the way that you currently conduct business and how it might be slightly adjusted to be better welcoming um, or facilitate that equal participation by people with all types of disabilities. Next slide, slide 20. There, another way that we implement uh, the various uh, provisions of the ADA for equal opportunity is through something called effective communication, slide 21. Uh, covered entities, Title One, Two, Three, all those titles, uh, must provide auxiliary aids and services when necessary to communicate effectively with people who have hearing, vision, and or speech disabilities. Your customers, your participants, um, your patients and members of the public, as well as their companions, their family members or friends who they might be traveling or, or be with in your spaces, 
um, with whoever you would normally communicate are all covered under um, the ADA in terms of having um, that effective communication provision being put in place. Next slide, slide 22. Um, and Carlene, if you'll click again to advance the content on these slides, thank you. I forgot they were animated. Um, so that some common um, examples of auxiliary aids and services and taking another look here again at how you are currently conducting business or providing services and are you and your staff prepared to provide written notes or printed materials um, when you have a customer or a visitor who is deaf or hard of hearing um, show up and, and request information of you. Um, similarly, do you have assistive listening systems and or devices? Are they working? Um, to check your batteries um, <laughs> and see if run through certain scenarios um, on if you had a, a customer approach uh, your service counter um, and request an assistive listening system is every person um, pr that's providing that frontline service able to appropriately respond to those requests for those aids and services that should be readily available. Um, qualified interpreters and obtaining those is another um, very common use of an auxiliary aid or service for somebody who is deaf or hard of hearing. And then also having captioned media, starting with, again, what you have existing are all of your existing videos and, and media productions that are online, either social media or on your websites, are those all captioned appropriately um, and um, you know, effectively, accurately, all that stuff. So taking a, a look at, again, what you have existing and seeing if it could be improved. Similarly, for people who are blind or have low vision, some very common auxiliary aids and services are large print, braille, and electronic materials. Um, any of your readily available publications, your brochures, your program guides for the season or um, uh, newsletters, things like that, any, anything that's readily available for the general public um, to enjoy or take home with them, um, to remember their, their visit to your establishment or hopefully trigger them to come back in the future again. Um, are those things readily available in, that, in those alternate formats, including large print, braille, or electronic? Um, audio, having audio described media as well, or uh, the, uh, the ability of staff to provide um, real time description of visual elements, depending on the types of services that you're providing, um, could be a very beneficial uh, way to provide a very uh, easy to deploy service to your customers and your visitors with disabilities. Next slide, slide 23. Another way that we implement uh, the, the various provisions under the ADA is through architectural and program access. Slide 24. There are three levels of access when it comes to the architectural side of the ADA. The first one is new construction. All new construction must comply with the standards for accessible design. Um, there should be checks and system of checks and balances um, established in those lines of, uh, of new construction to ensure that everything from the planning stage up through construction and, and execution and final ribbon cutting um, on an establishment is done in a fully accessible way. The next level is alterations of existing facilities. Most of us on the call today probably are dealing with a facility or a building or a location that's been in existence for a while. Maybe it's had several different uses and iterations. Maybe it was originally designed as a particular type of building or facility and now has a totally different purpose. Um, when you are altering an existing facility, anything that you touch, you fix. It's pretty simple. Um, those alterations, uh, when you change something, must comply with the standards to the maximum extent that, that, that it possibly can. Um, and uh, so it just kind of depends on what you're doing, what you're touching, you fix. If you replace a door, make sure that door is as accessible as it can be when it's going in. Um, if you're replacing all of the um, signs throughout the facility, make sure that those signs comply with uh, the technical provisions for accessible room signage, if that's something that's required in your facility. Um, and that, uh, that 800 number that Carlene gave out earlier is a good way to check and see if you're altering something, what needs to be fixed um, in terms of uh, accessible design. 
And then the last, the third level of access um, are existing facilities that are not being altered. Um, there is an obligation there for something called program access to in, look internally at what services you are providing to the public and how those services can be provided in an accessible way if you're dealing with a facility that might not be fully compliant with the standards right now. Um, program access is the obligation, as is readily achievable barrier removal. Um, that's a specific provision for Title III entities, um, and that's what we're, we're talking about today. Those things that can be done with um, you know, low cost or on a rolling basis, every fiscal year you plan for some new level of access Access to be integrated into the design of your facility until it is final, um, fully compliant with the standards. Next slide, slide 25. Program access for Title II um, means that uh, programs offered in existing facilities must be accessible when viewed in their entirety. Um, and that's considering programs as a whole. Um, many programs might be offered in more than one location, for example. Um, so making sure that um, the opportunity to participate um, in that service is being provided in that accessible location or that there's enough opportunity um, to experience all of the um, key components and critical components of that program in an accessible way. Next slide. For Title III, and this is slide 26, um, that readily achievable barrier removal, what the ADA says about this is that barriers in existing facilities must be removed when it is readily achievable, meaning that it's easily accomplishable and able to be carried out without much difficulty or expense. And voila, that's what we're here today talking about. Next slide, 27. There are alternatives to barrier, the barrier removal provision. So when it is not readily achievable to remove barriers, something's gonna take a lot more time and a lot more planning to implement than you might have available funds or staff or the ability to take on right now, consider alternatives. Um, and some examples listed here are um, delivering those goods and services at alternative locations, um, including something like home delivery or curbside service, which has become a very popular service uh, in pandemic times um, that should be you know, carried forward for the benefit of everyone um, going forward, whether or not it's something that's regularly provided or provided on request um, that you are that your business is prepared um, to provide that service. Um, if your building is physically inaccessible, if you're still working toward that barrier removal, but it's not easily accomplished right now, um, there are ways to make that uh, service accessible in the meantime. Also, things like retrieving merchandise from inaccessible shelves or racks. Every shelf and every display um, does not need to be at a fully accessible height um, and independently operable. That means that your staff is um, well-trained and well-aware that if somebody needs assistance, they're there and able to provide that assistance. Um, and that is that is a necessary service because not everything um, within that retail environment or that merchandise um, display is fully accessible um, independently. Um, so those are just a couple of examples for barrier removal. Next slide. Slide 28, I wanna mention that the Department of Justice has a couple of recommended priority areas for barrier removal, and we're not gonna be specifically adhering to those for the, the other ideas conveyed in this presentation, but they're worth mentioning. Um, if you're wondering where to start in terms of um, evaluating your existing facilities that you're working with, um, maybe start with, with these priorities. The first one is the accessible approach and entrance. How are people arriving to your facility and how are they getting in the door? Um, is that intuitively uh, available, that information intuitively available for people um, who arrive to your site? Um, is there directional signage showing them where the accessible location, the accessible entrance is, um, as opposed to getting to the front door and just assuming that that's not a business that's gonna be accessible to them. If you have it and nobody knows about it, nobody's gonna use it. Um, priority two is access to goods and services. So what we were just talking about, you have 
uh, a building that is not physically um, compliant fully with uh, the architectural access standards, um, but you're still providing a, a good or service to the the public. Um, you want to make sure that you're thinking about the ways in which um, you can offer those services to the public in an accessible way while you're still working towards the removal of those barriers. Priority number three is access to restrooms. Always, always a good idea um, to focus on uh, access to restrooms and public amenities um, that are kind of critical to health life safety. And then priority four are any other means necessary. You know the ins and outs of what you do and the services that you provide um, within your agency, entity, business, facility, whatever it is that you do. You know that information the best. So whatever people are most commonly utilizing, um, whatever folks are meant to take away um, as the big aha or benefit from experiencing all that you have to offer, um, focus on those areas um, and, uh, and you'll have a, a high return on investment. Next slide, 29. The critical priority here always, whether you're looking at the approach and entrance, the goods and services, the restrooms or anything else, the critical priority here is integration. Um, the methods that you use to facilitate that equivalent access should enable people with disabilities whenever possible to participate in programs and receive services in the same location and in the same ways as other people. That is always the goal. Um, it is, you know, all but written in stone in terms of um, being this being a critical area. Um, for um, removal of barriers, for equal opportunity, um, for enabling the benefits uh, of your services for people with disabilities, with and without disabilities. Um, integration is key. Um, and so whatever methods you're using to uh, improve the experience for um, your public um, members that you're trying to reach, um, always consider the most integrated um, opportunity and experience possible. Next slide. Slide 30. Here's where we're going to transition into some of these ideas for um, low cost but high impact. Anything that takes that's going to have a change, um, res uh, a resulting change um, in the environment or in the way that you do business is going to take time, money, and personnel. Um, and you really want to protect your most valuable assets um, and increase those opportunities for people of all abilities by implementing those low cost, high impact options for barrier removal. Um, at this point, Carlene, I'm going to ask uh, if there are any questions that I might address now related more to the compliance coverage and obligation for barrier removal before we go into some of these ideas for low cost, high impact. Sure. Thanks so much, Michelle. Um, we do have a couple of questions. One is, um, when is a modification or accommodation triggered for a religious entity? Meaning, I know generally they aren't covered, but what if they charge for the use of their facilities to the general public and those facilities aren't accessible? That is a great question and a common one. Um, there is a very lovely um, fact sheet on the um, ADA National Network website, adata.org, on religious entities um, and their coverages under the, under the ADA, their obligations for that type of coverage. Um, essentially, if there are um, public spaces being um, rented out, it is the obligation of the entity renting the space to make sure that their services are being provided um, in an accessible location within that facility. So if you're renting um, a space from a religious entity, it's on the obligation of the, the person providing the program in that space to make sure that it's an accessible experience. Um, so maybe not all areas of the, the, ent the religious entity is accessible or maybe it's not accessible at all. Um, if there is a known um, need for uh, access um, or even if there's not a known need for access, it's a public program that's being housed, a bazaar, a fair, a 
craft show, you know, something uh, being held in those events, um, the highest level of access needs to be provided possible. And that obligation rests on um, the person that is renting the space, not necessarily um, the religious entity itself. Um, there's kind of a, a lot of factors to be considered in that. Um, so I would certainly uh, encourage uh, this person who asked the question to um, contact their regional ADA center and, and describe um, the exact situation uh, that they're um, experiencing, um, but also to look at that technical assistance fact sheet um, from adata.org. And I think if you just type in religion or religious, it'll pop right up. Thank you. That did very much help clarify. Um, so we got another question here. What about interior doors, not necessarily exterior public doors? Do they also have to meet the readily achievable um, guidelines or the 2010 standards? Great question. Again, interior doors have a particular, a couple particular provisions um, under the ADA. What you want to look at in terms of those interior doors or even prioritizing changes or upgrades to those interior doors or pathways is what are, where, where are you going? Where is the public meant to go? If the interior door to say a staff only area um, is inaccessible, but you don't have a staff member who needs to access that space, well, maybe or maybe not, it needs to be um, made accessible. And that could be in terms of the door width, the hardware that is, um, that is used to operate the door, things like that. So it kind of depends on where you're going and what you're using that door for um, in terms of where you would focus your energy in terms of making those improvements. Obviously public areas, if you're if, if the interior door is along a primary path of travel to your services, that would be a, a high priority um, area to investigate if that door is compliant. Um, the other thing that interior, the other um, obligation for interior doors is the weight or the, the pressure that it takes to operate that door. Um, so maybe you're looking at um, adjusting or replacing the door operating mechanism so that the door becomes a little bit lighter to operate doesn't necessarily mean that the solution there um, is an automatic door operator in all instances, although that may be a solution in some applications, but interior doors um, generally just have that five pounds or less um, of weight applied to operate it, um, need to make sure that the hardware on the doors is, is operable um, with a closed fist or without tight grasping or pinching, twisting of the wrist, that kind of thing, um, and that the, the doorway is wide enough. Um, something that might preclude you from widening a doorway or considering that a readily achievable um, barrier removal might be the presence of um, having to relocate uh, electrical service or duct work for heating and cooling. Um, that may put a put a bit of a damper in your readily achievable um, barrier removal, but it, it's worth investigating um, and seeing what can be readily achievable and readily done along that primary route um, in an interior space. So great, great, great question. Got it. Thanks so much. Um, I think that's it for now. Um, if you could just quickly repeat where to find the information on obligations for or non-obligations for religious entities and private clubs. Absolutely. Um, the website is adata.org. And in the search bar at the top of the screen, simply type in religious. and it should pop right up. Perfect. Thank you. Um, You're very welcome. I think that's it for now. So I think we can charge ahead. Great. Next slide, slide 31, I believe. Yep. So first idea, big idea for a high uh, impact, low cost is an information upgrade. Um, in this you know, time of sort of information overload, you can find anything on the internet. You wanna make sure that the information that's being conveyed about your space and about your services is accurate, um, is easy to find, is accessible to begin with. Um, is, is your website accessible? Are you posting accessible content? 
um, and as well as you know, what information about accessible features or potential barriers are you sharing with your audience? Um, because there is um, a need for people to understand the expectation of um, what they're going to encounter when they visit your facility or visit um, your, um, uh, take, take advantage of your services that you have to offer. So what information about those features are you sharing? Um, can that information be um, provided in a easier to find level of your website? Oftentimes, um, one of the frustrations um, that are is encountered by people with disabilities is having to dig so far down in a website to find um, the accessibility related information that if it takes more than two or three clicks, they give up and they might not even take advantage of all the great things that you have to offer simply because you made the information too hard to find. So where and how can your audience find that information on what features you do have available? Um, posting a simple welcome statement that we welcome people of all abilities, races, nationalities um, into our place of business. Um, is is also a benefit um, to just letting letting folks know that they're welcome in your space um, is is a really great way to also upgrade the the information that you're providing to the public. Next slide, thirty two. Also consider this when you're thinking about an information upgrade and what information you might put out there. First, take things from your own perspective. What information would you want to know about your location, the services available, et cetera, when planning a visit or when planning to you know, put in an order for the next best Chinese food you've ever had or whatever service it is that you're providing. And then also take that a, a step further and provide some variations on that theme. What information would you want to know as a person with mobility uh, limitations or mobility disability, as a person with hearing loss or a person who is deaf, as a person with a visual impairment or who is blind, um, as a person with sensory needs? I've listed neurodiversity here as kind of the umbrella term for uh, people who experience the world in other ways. Um, what would you want to know or what would, um, you know, you, you want um, you know, the family members of uh, or companions of individuals with disabilities to know ahead of their visit to make their uh, experience just that little bit more welcoming, that little bit easier. Um, and uh, you know what? What can you? What information can you offer on the expectations of what someone's going to encounter at your site um, from an accessibility standpoint and from a an inclusion standpoint? Um, that would be great information to provide front and center, um, along with any other policies or procedure related things for requesting things like sign language interpreters or um, locating or asking where the braille and large print materials are found and, and stuff like that. Um, so kind of going again, back to basics, but pushing it just that little bit further um, to have that high impact in, in terms of information sharing and what's readily available for folks. Next slide, slide 33. Here's some big ideas for the built environment. And um, what I've got showing on this slide are, are building blocks of various colors um, going up in, in uh, number uh, to the right. So, and this is listing on the slide the eight uh, building blocks that are in the um, ADA uh, design standards. And those are floor or ground surfaces, changes in level, turning space, clear for floor or ground space, knee and toe clearance, protruding objects, reach ranges, and operable parts. If any of these terms are foreign to you, essentially what these refer to are, um, how am I going to get around in your space? Am I going to walk into or bump into any hazards? Um, and uh, can I interact with everything that I'm intended to interact with within a certain environment. So we'll give some, some examples here, but often going back to basics um, with the building blocks can be really easy to see 
in terms of uh, you know, not needing specialized knowledge or understanding of the design standards, but being able to have that lens for how somebody might physically exist in a space, whether they have a physical um, mobility need, um, a, or a, they're visually impaired, have are blind or have low vision, um, or you know hearing impair, have a hearing impairment, or um, uh, have a, a neurodiversity neurodiversity or sensory need um, as well. Next slide, slide thirty four. So the first idea for the building blocks is um, accessible floor or ground surfaces. They are firm, stable, and slip resistant. They're free from openings and gaps greater than a half an inch, and they have changes in level a quarter inch high maximum or a half inch high maximum if they're beveled. So that's uh, things like doors or going from room to room, space to space, um, along a sidewalk, um, those kinds of things. The image here shows kind of a close up of um, some brick pavers on um, an exterior route um, in sort of an urban environment. Um, things like this, these types of surfaces have a, a tendency to break down over time. Um, and if they're not properly maintained, those openings can open up and provide a tripping hazard um, for all types of people, um, not just people with disabilities. Um, but they do provide a specific type of hazard for somebody who's using something like a cane, a crutch, a walker, a wheelchair, um, something like that, uh, that, you know, can, can provide that extra little safety hazard for, for somebody wanting to get around in that space. So that's one of those things to look for, or to look for those changes in level. Look at your floor and ground surfaces. Can something be improved um, about those to make it a little bit more user-friendly for a wide, uh, and have that wide and high impact in making those adjustments? Slide 35. Similarly, um, moving on to a couple of other building blocks um, where individuals are expected to enter a space, conduct whatever business they're doing in there, um, and then depart that location. Um, there should be a clear floor or ground space at each area of interaction, whether that's a drinking fountain, a service counter, um, a museum exhibit. Um, oh my goodness. A, a kiosk of some kind, anything that someone is meant to interact with, um, a sink, um, you know, really anything that uh, somebody is able to approach and use. That clear floor or ground space needs to, to be there um, for somebody who's using a mobility device. Um, and then turning space um, in the diagram depicted, that's that 60 inch minimum diameter clearance um, inside this restroom facility. Um, is necessary for, for safe and effective maneuverability. That's that get in, turn around, and get back out um, factor. There's multiple ways to provide turning space. Um, the circular turning space of 60 inches wide minimum is one of those ways. Um, it's probably the easiest also to see. Um, I know that um, several um, uh, community groups um, who have offered to um, help businesses evaluate the accessibility of their spaces often um, get a tablecloth uh, cut out or something, a circular table tablecloth um, and are able to put that in various spaces to see if that turning space is available within a certain environment. Um, it's something that's very easy to see um, in terms of maneuverability. And are those things clear? Um, if you're meant to um, enter a building um, by a ramp, for example, and but the top of the ramp is constantly cluttered with packages that are dropped off or um, other, other types of equipment that's temporar temporarily stored there, um, using the air quotes there. Um, you know, can those areas be kept clear again for that maneuverability for somebody who needs it in the moment and there's not that need for specialized assistance um, where something needs to be moved in order for somebody to use something that should be readily available to them. Um, that's a really good way to have a very high impact um, on the experience of somebody with a disability. Next slide, slide 36. 
Continuing in the theme of building blocks, um, public areas should be free of hazards and obstructions, including but not limited to um, objects that might not be visually detected by an individual who is blind. These are called protruding objects. So something that is installed on a wall, for example, protrudes out a little bit too far. Somebody who can't see that might bump their arm or worse, their head. Um, or really potentially become injured by something that is sticking out into uh, the, the way that people are meant to move through a space. Um, can that be moved? Can it be blocked? Can there something be placed beneath it that's not easily movable so it directs people around those potential hazards? Those are really easy things to fix um, and really easy things to see as well. Um, also, items that block the required knee and toe clearance uh, beneath certain elements like drinking fountains, tables, and counters, um, again, is are those areas being cluttered by things that don't really need to be there? Um, and uh, or countertops are is is the low countertop at a service counter being kept clear for use uh, by people who are seated or who are using mobility devices or people of short stature. Those are all very easy things to see. Um, and again, very high impact, just clearing those out, finding another location um, to store items uh, can provide that higher level of access. And I'm telling you, it seems silly, but it's gonna have a very high impact. Next slide, slide 37. The last idea with some building blocks is um, those elements or features that are meant to be manipulated in some way. So these are um, your doorknobs, your light switches, your, oh goodness, um, any type of barricade that's meant to be lifted and moved to get through a, a certain space. Um, oh my goodness, handles on uh, your sinks, um, struggling to find examples, but anything that's meant to be <laughs> manipulated in some way, um, that those things need to be located within acceptable reach range requirements dimensions. So able, capable of being reached by somebody in a seated position or somebody of short stature um, that can easily reach those items and then have operable parts that are capable, capable of being activated with a closed fist and with minimal effort. Um, so we talked about that relative to doors. Um, taking a look at the doorways along your public routes um, that have, uh, if there's anything that still has a knob handle, switching that out for a lever um, or some other easily activated uh, device. Again, low cost, high impact, high, high impact. And this uh, photo that's provided here on this slide for you is uh, simply comical in nature. It's a very small child reaching for an object um, in the middle of a table. Next slide, slide 38. So moving on from your building blocks and going back to sort of the idea of the uh, Department of Justice priorities for readily achievable barrier removal and looking at the, the site arrival itself. And most people are going to arrive to whatever site you are at via some level of transportation or vehicle. So accessible parking really sets the stage for should I stay or should I go? If the parking lot is not easy to get in and out of, if it's not easy for, for somebody to get in and out of their vehicle, they might be passing you on by. Um, so there's uh, the three S's of accessible parking, scoping, striping, and signage. Um, and I've got a couple of questions listed on the slide here um, for looking at those features of your accessible parking. First under scoping is how many accessible parking spaces do you have versus how many accessible parking spaces should you have? And is there a possibility of increasing the number of spaces that you're, you're providing? There's also specific provisions in um, the design standards for how many standard vehicle um, parking space, accessible parking spaces and van accessible parking spaces you're required to have. Again, another reason to call that 800 number that Carlene mentioned um, to help, uh, to get some help walking through that determination of how many you have versus how many you should have and of what type. Um, you know, where the, the ADA centers can, can help you to make that determination for sure. 
Um, striping, does each accessible parking space have an adjoining access aisle? This is a very common overlooked um, provision in the standards. An accessible parking space has to have that adjacent access aisle for someone to deploy a lift um, or to get you know, up close to their vehicle and their mobility device and transfer um, into the vehicle, um, if, it, if not by a ramp, by, by other transfer means. Um, so those are required. Um, and is the ac access aisle marked to discourage parking in it? Um, there's various ways to accomplish that um, and various dimensions. Um, the image here on the, on the slide shows a parking space outline and access aisle outlined in white paint and there's yellow paint uh, hash marks denoting the area where you're not supposed to park. Um, there's many ways to go about doing that. Um, and again, another reason to pick up the phone and call that 800 number. Um, but easy, easy to uh, to do uh, with a can of paint um, and have a high impact. And then lastly, uh, for parking signage, um, is each accessible parking space individually marked with the appropriate signage? Um, accessible parking spaces are required to have vertical signs at the front of the parking space or um, other vertical signs denoting a, an accessible parking area. Um, and is that, in, is that signage installed at the proper height? Um, I've seen it all from parking spaces with, uh, parking areas with no signage whatsoever to parking spaces with signs that are like about five or six inches off the ground um, to something in between that and like astronomically high. Um, I've seen it all. But take, take a look at what you are currently offering in terms of signage and see if it's again intuitive um, to, to understand where those accessible parking spaces are when you enter a parking lot, um, as well as uh, be able to um, get in and out of your vehicle safely and effectively. Next slide, slide 37, I believe. Nope, 39. <laughs> uh, for restrooms, uh, again, going back to the DOJ priority, restrooms are always a good idea to focus your energies. There's a ton of dimensions um, in restrooms, going back to compliance with the accessible accessibility standards for accessible design. Um, there's tons of things to be manipulated in a restroom. And the one place that you do not want to struggle when you have to use it is a restroom. <laughs> um, so check for several things uh, in your public restrooms. Um, check for and improve signage. Do you have signage um, installed in the appropriate space? Um, is Does it have the required um, pictograms and tactile characters and braille? Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff just related to signage um, that could be improved very, very easily uh, by purchasing a couple of new signs or reinstalling the signs that you already have if they're in the wrong place. Uh, insulate the pipes beneath sinks. Uh, this is also another common one where the, the pipes might not be not be fully insulated against contact, um, might not be insulated at all, uh, might have some um, things protruding out from under the sink that could cause a, a safety hazard for somebody who does not have sensation or has limited sensation um, in their legs. Um, so when pulling underneath that sink, um, that could be, be uh, become a potential safety hazard, either with sensitivities to hot and cold or, again, just sharp things uh, being within that required knee and toe clearance beneath that element. So insulating your pipes um, is, a, is a great easy way um, to uh, upgrade um, and improve the experience in a restroom. Um, the next uh, bullet is install hooks, soap dispensers, hand dryers, et cetera, within accessible reach range. Once you see uh, the, the building blocks uh, for what they are in an environment, you're not gonna unsee it. So sorry, not sorry. Um, <laughs> having things within accessible reach range re really meets the needs of everyone. Um, also various uh, people at various um, life stages. Um, you know, my young child wants to hang up, be able to hang up her coat independently in a restroom, I certainly don't want to have to hold it for her while she uses a restroom. Um, you know, and same with someone who's using a mobility device or of short stature, they want to be able to independently take advantage of the amenities that you're providing in the restroom. So having hooks at uh, accessible heights, um, 
being able to reach the soap dispenser and the hand dryer, um, it's that those are pretty important things um, for, for a, a lot of reasons. Um, another good idea, an inexpensive idea in a restroom is replacing inaccessible latch mechanisms on toilet compartments. Um, that goes back to that building block of those operable parts. So a lot of times uh, the latch mechanism in um, a toilet stall may be the very tiny slide latch that you have to slide over and pinch to, to grasp and, and get over uh, to lock the stall. Um, you want to replace those, excuse me, with something that's a little easier to manip manipulate, either just a simple slide uh, only mechanism, um, or I've seen also like the paddles that you could um, kind of turn over with a closed fist. Um, there's all types of different hardware uh, possibilities, uh, just depending on the, the constraints of the space that you're working with um, in, in those toilet stalls or toilet rooms. Um, but also very low, very low cost, quick trip to Home Depot or Lowe's or any other hardware store um, and high impact uh, on your users. Another idea for restrooms um, and often an, an overlooked need um, is the uh, desire for a full length mirror in um, a restroom facility. Um, a lot of times the only restroom or the, excuse me, the only mirror that's provided in a restroom is the one above the sinks. Um, and sometimes those mirrors can be very, very high. Um, the angled mirrors that come out from the wall um, can often provide a distorted view of somebody who's seated or of short stature. So a full length mirror would really meet the needs of everyone. And it helps figure out if you've got a piece of toilet paper stuck to your shoe. So, um, you know, really is just a, a good idea all around. Next slide, slide 40. Here's some um, examples of kind of the, the good, the bad, and the really not great um, about uh, restrooms and, and pointing out the things that you can easily see on simple inspection um, in these photos. So that's a series of three photos left to right um, of um, three different images of uh, restroom facilities. The first image on the, on the left shows a wall-mounted sink with um, a mirror above it and a soap dispenser installed on the toilet stall to the left of the sink. And there are orange arrows um, denoting the depth of the soap dispenser and the height of it above the floor, the height of the mirror above the floor, um, the exposed pipes beneath the sink, and then also the force that it takes to um, activate the hot and cold water um, at the sink itself. All of those things within that very small space, checking them for um, you know, des the design and operability and usability in comparison to um, the accessibility standards, um, as well as seeing if there's just a, a way to improve uh, the usability of that space overall. Um, that's, it's easy to see. It's easy to pick out once you know uh, what to look for. The middle uh, image on the slide is um, that same restroom, but an exterior view. Um, there is signage and it's installed on the correct side of the door, but it's about six feet off the ground. Um, there, the signage there is compliant signage. It's got the raised characters, it has braille, it has the pictograms, but it's way out of reach for somebody who is blind or has low vision who wants to locate that sign and expects it to be at the latch side of that door uh, within a certain height range. Um, so it's simply moving that down to uh, its acceptable dimensions um, makes it fully usable um, by a whole lot more users. Um, and uh, also in that image is, you can see the um, paper towel dispenser in just inside the room. And you'd wanna check the depth and the height of, uh, of that unit also related to um, protruding objects um, and also operability of the, the operable parts for that one. So all things that you can easily check out in just one small space. The image on the right, um, I wanted to highlight, there's uh, two purple boxes highlighting the um, signage to the latch side of the door and then also the handle um, on the door. Um, this is a, an entrance to a boys restroom. There's the, a painted uh, wooden plank above the door that says boys on it. Um, and you can have decorative uh, or um, 
you know, unconventional signage um, for your restrooms, but the, the tactile sign um, is required at a certain space and height on that latch side of the door. Um, all of those basics, all of those fundamentals, those building blocks still need to be there. Um, so again, this is, a, this is a good example of you've still maintained the aesthetic of whatever space um, this restroom happens to be in, the operable parts on the door, uh, being a lever handle is way better than it being a door knob, and the signage being installed at the, at the right height and location in relation to that door, all two thumbs up for that. Next slide, slide 41. A note about maintenance. So the idea here is repair what is broken, reinforce what is heavily used. And this is a simple check of various elements, all going all the way back to the, that DOJ priority list um, of your entrances, um, your, um, your restrooms again, um, any other services that you're providing those types of things. Uh, I've provided some, some other ideas on the slide as well. Um, so surfacing, um, oftentimes changes in level and those building blocks get out of whack when there's two surfaces that meet um, and they're in conflict with one another. They're, they're not the same surface or maybe they are the same surface, but there's been a big freeze thaw situation going on or tree roots um, getting in the way that are creating a, a potential hazard in that environment. Um, so those are things that you can look at or um, providing fill material um, to make sure that that's a, a smoother transition from one surface to another. Um, that's a really good way to repair what is broken and reinforce what is heavily used. Um, same thing with your doorways and entrances. Um, if, if there's a, a, a door operating mechanism that is broken, you need to replace the battery, replace the battery. Um, and particularly if it's a main entrance, um, that would be a, a, a high uh, priority area and high impact area. Um, it just impacting the, the ability of someone to get into your space. Technology is its, its, its own animal in itself, um, but there is, if something is in existence and in place um, for, uh, for, to meet the need of a specific audience, you wanna make sure that it's working properly. And um, again, I mentioned those battery operated amenities um, as well. So check, check those batteries and make sure that things are working the way they should. Next slide, 42. Finally, your personnel investments, um, your staff, your volunteers, your partner agencies, your community organizations, are they receiving the uh, appropriate training? Um, uh, are you pushing the envelope in terms of what they're capable um, of doing and the services that they're providing on your behalf and on behalf of your agency or your entity or your business? Um, investing in your personnel and um, doing making sure that everybody is prepared to provide that exemplary customer service goes a very long way. Next slide, slide 43. Um, just before we get to question and answer, and I realize that, that we are uh, at the, the end of our hour together, um, I wanted to mention that, did you know, there are tax incentives that are available to encourage compliance with the ADA specific to um, readily achievable barrier removal. Um, there's a fact sheet, again, available on adata.org, um, and that full URL um, is linked there. Michelle, thank you so much. That was a lot of great information. For those of you who did have questions that were unanswered, um, please do give us a call here at the ADA Center, 1-800-949-4232. Um, you can also call us um, at 301-217-0124. Um, I want to thank everybody again for joining us. Thank you again, Michelle. Um, some of the information uh, regarding parking, we had a number of questions can be found at adata.org um, or at our website, adainfo.org. I want to thank you for joining us. And uh, I hope that everybody has a great afternoon.